Hello, I'm Saifuddin Amos. Welcome to the Bitcoin Standard Podcast, bringing you seminars from saifuddin.com, my online learning and publishing platform, where you can be the first to read my work and take my online courses on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Members can read the draft of my next book, The Fiat Standard, in full, and also receive chapters from my forthcoming textbook, Principles of Economics, as they are written. By joining saifuddin.com, you can also join our regular seminars, which you hear on this podcast. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by BitMEX Spot, the brand new spot exchange from BitMEX. You've probably heard of BitMEX, one of the oldest large Bitcoin companies who played a leading role in helping Bitcoin emerge victorious from the hard fork wars of 2017. Their derivatives trading platform has stood the test of time and set the standard for reliability and performance for Bitcoin companies. BitMEX is now bringing that reliability to its spot exchange and it is celebrating the launch of BitMEX Spot with a total of $1 million in prizes and a first prize of half a million dollars. Sign up on bitmex.com slash to begin buying Bitcoin and get a chance of winning. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coin or friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Today's guest is a little bit different from usual guests. Today's guest is English professional footballer Kieran Gibbs, who currently plays for Inter Miami FC. And most of you might know him from his time at Arsenal Football Club and West Bromwich Albion, as well as the England national team. Kieran is a Bitcoiner and I am a big football fan. So this is something that I've really looked forward to. Uh, because I'm really looking forward to talking to somebody who knows a lot about football and how Bitcoin has affected him and how Bitcoin has uh, affected his life, what it has meant to him as an athlete. And it's something that I'm really looking forward to. So, Kieran, thank you so much for joining us today. No, not a problem. I mean, to be honest, it's an honor, man. I'm, I was I was stoked when you messaged me to, uh, <laughs> to come on. I've been following you for so long, Safi, so... Well, it's, it's, it's a real honor to have you here, Ben. Um, I've uh, followed you for much longer than you followed me, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you from uh, when you made your debut for Arsenal. I follow football very closely and I remember you very well. I watched many, many games for you over the years. I'm not an Arsenal fan, as you know, I'm a Liverpool fan. I, uh, yeah, I've enjoyed watching you. Um, mostly I haven't actually, I was looking at your record against Liverpool and you have an incredibly good record against Liverpool. I don't know if you've, uh, you probably remember, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was gonna say, it's actually one of, uh, one of my highlights. That's something that I'm quite proud of. Um, my record at, at Anfield, especially. Even for West Brom, when I signed at West Brom, we played there, uh, um in the fa cup we won actually i'm pretty sure we won yeah um, and so yeah and obviously all of the premier league games um for arsenal and and west brom i've always managed to uh i'm probably a bit of i was probably a bit of a bogey for them at anfield over the yeah I was looking for things to tease you with, but unfortunately, uh, don't have much to go uh, with. You weren't you weren't there for the five one. I think you were on the bench for the time when uh, Liverpool won five one at. Uh, That's right. Arsenal. Yeah, you were yeah. on the bench, so you got away. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember my first game at Anfield. It was it was four four. Went on. Oh, yeah. Having scored. I remember that one. Goals. So that was basically the game that ended Liverpool's title challenge in 2009. Yeah. Uh, if they'd won that game, we were likely going to be champions, and uh, we didn't. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that game. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I followed Wenger, Arsene Wenger, very, very closely for a lot of time. 
and I admire the man a lot. I think he is an incredible manager, one of the top managers of all time. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, you know, at his prime, they had such a good record against Liverpool. It was so painful. And what was made, what made it so painful is that they did it so beautifully. Arsenal at their prime, they were just so good at doing it. You know, like that 4-4 with Andrei Arshavin just out of this world. As much as it hurt, you couldn't help but sit there and admire. Yeah. And which kind of made it hurt even more. Yeah. Because you wanted that for yourself. You didn't want to be uh, <laughs> getting right. beaten by that. But it was just such beautiful football. Yeah, well, he, he changed the game game didn't he he really like revolutionized the game so I mean yeah his years and some of the teams that he had and that he built you know his ability to find like really raw players from overseas and bring them over and polish them into um, high high quality players uh, was I mean it was frightening really you look at players like Nicholas Anelka I mean I don't know if you remember him, but... Of course. Yeah, Yeah. like, he brought him over. He probably bought him for, like, 500K, you know? 300, 300, precisely, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sold sold him for 30 million to Real Madrid a couple of seasons later. Yeah. Um, Uh, Basically built Arsenal, uh, built the Arsenal team off of that transfer. I mean, just got Anelka from nowhere, made 100X on him, flipped him... (laughs) Like a shit coin. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and, and in a sense, it was like that because Anelka, uh, I remember it took him until the new year to score at Real Madrid. For some reason, without Wenger, he went to Real Madrid and he was just back to being the player that he was before he. Uh, incredible. Incredible. Yeah. So, yeah, no, and, and he, he's an economist, right? By, by background. Oh, that's right. I forgot so, that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So he. Um, he knows his stuff. I mean, maybe I should connect you with him so that I can try and connect you with him. He would love, where he would love Bitcoin. I really oh, I would. would. I would absolutely love to talk to Arsene Wenger. I cannot yeah. tell you how much I admired this man. And you know, the reason that I wanted to talk to you about uh, football is because my understanding of time preference, which I speak about at the Bitcoin standard, when I th- when I think of it, um, what helped develop my understanding of time preference is watching Arsene Wenger's Arsenal play low time preference football because that's what they do. It's, you know, there was, there's like, you know, when you start playing football, when you're a kid, you just want to kick the ball into the goal. You know, you just want to be Ronaldo. You want to be Romario. You want to be Messi. You want to be the number nine, the number 10. You just kick it into the ball. And so, you know, when five-year-olds and eight-year-olds are playing, it's a very high time preference game. It's just every kid wants to run at the ball and take it and put it into the goal. (laughs) And the lowering of the time preference is to take a player and convince them that, look, yeah, you can take a shot every time you get the ball, but almost certainly you're not going to score. But if you take the ball, give it to your teammate, you can put them in a better position and then they can put their other teammate in the in a better position. And then, you know, instead of cashing out on your possession right now by taking a shot, you invest it into a better possession, a better position. Yes. Possession at a better position for your teammate. Mm-hmm. And then he can either cash it out and take a shot or invest it and, you know, lower his time preference, delay the gratification, pass the ball on to his other teammates so that the teammate can do it. Right. And so the joke about Arsenal was that they, they had to pass it into the goal. Into the goal, yeah. Because they would, you know, they couldn't just take a shot. They had to basically make the other team submit and then, you know, have Thierry right. Henry just waltz it into the net. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, that, that's like when you mention that, in that uh, regard, it's, it's so true because, and you know, there's many different ways to, to play the game, right? It's not to say that that is the right or, there's no right or wrong way. You know, when I went to West Brom, I had to learn a whole different style of football. And you could say that, under managers like Allardyce, you know, it, it probably was a bit, it was, it was high preference style because, you know, you would have to take an op- any opportunity that you could get because when you're playing at that level and you're playing against, you know, the best teams in the world, you ain't going to get many chances. So you have to take what you can get. And so there's just many different ways, but yeah, like you say, um, 
I mean, he would always teach us, you know, how to suffocate the opponent um, with, with possession because, you know, psychologically we felt like we could win, win these games psychologically in the first 15, 20 minutes of a game because, you know, you, you feel like you can give them zero chance of even putting three passes together and they just feel like they're just bamboozled by, you know, a lot of possession and they, you, you can, you can let them know it's going to be a long game, um, you know, within the first, within the first 20 minutes. And it, it references, it goes back to, like you say, low, low time preference style football, which, you know, when you mentioned that to me, I thought it was really interesting because I never thought of it like that, but um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 quite remarkable that you got the the archetype low time preference manager in Arsene Wenger, and then the archetype high time preference manager in Sam Allardyce. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In that, like Sam Allardyce doesn't Allard get more opposite really, than that. It yeah. absolutely does not. Like he was just standing there at the sideline, telling his players to just kick the knee pads off of the yeah. opposition <laughs> and get the ball to their big number nine who will drop right. it down to their skillful right. number 10 who yeah. will bury it, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, it, it helped me learn more about the game because that the only way I knew to play the game since I was, you know, 14 years old was the, the style that Arsenal play. You know, yeah. so that was all I knew. I, I didn't know. I didn't really know how to play the game any other way, um, because it was just embedded in me from such a young age. Um, and so it's, it was just all learning. You know, learning different different ways to play. Um, you know, th- these guys these guys are successful managers still, right? That, that, that we're talking about just because it's a yeah, absolutely. Style, you know, yeah, and I, I mean, there's. Uh... Like I, I would say over time the game has dropped its time preference. Like you, you know, in the in, in the nineteen fifties it was a lot more direct. Um, and over time, people have kind of advanced. But you know, th- there's always different styles, and um, it, it's it's not a judgment on that style. Whatever wins oh. trophies, uh, yeah, whatever works. And you know, Mourinho came on later and basically did. Uh, Sam Allardyce football with a European accent and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, got yeah, called yeah, yeah. genius for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he's done it many different with many different teams yeah. and won many different things. So, um, but yeah, it's just when you it, it got my it got my mind racing when you mentioned about uh, that because we have a lot of possession. We always have a lot of possession, and it reminded me of like. The, the the style of the Bitcoin network because it's like with every pass, it gets stronger, you know, and you just eventually suffocate the the other team, the opposition, and it's it's just very similar. It's just so similar. So you've got my mind racing the last uh, the last day or two. That's amazing. You know, I. Uh... Interestingly enough, the current managing director of the IMF, Kristina Georgieva, was once trying to uh, speak about how her, um, what she views as the problems facing the world economy. And she thought that a, a major issue with the world economy is essentially, I mean, she looks like she's finally read some decent economics. She's come to the realization that the problem that they have is that they've been basically high time preference. In this video, uh, she's sitting there with Christine Lagarde and uh, Jerome Powell, and uh, you know it's a pretty high-level discussion. And she's trying to explain what she views as the problem of short-termism in the way that in which they're taking their uh, decisions. And basically, she makes the case for the uh, same uh, kind of analysis of um, football that we were discussing. Uh, just now, but from an IMF's perspective. I've seen this. I I think we are not paying sufficient attention to the law of unintended consequences. We take decisions with an objective in mind and rarely think through what may happen that is not our objective. Uh, And then uh, we wrestle uh, 
with the with the impact of it. Um, take uh, any 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 decision that is a massive decision, like uh, the decision that we need to spend to support the economy. And at that time, we did recognize that may lead to too much money in circulation, too few goods, but didn't really quite think through the consequence in a way that mm. upfront would have informed better uh, what, what we do. And I, we act sometimes like eight years old playing soccer. Here is the ball, we are all at the ball and we don't cover the rest of the field. Our ability to deal with more than one crisis at one time is very, very uh, limited. What she's saying in it is that basically uh, she likens uh, global monetary policy and uh, policymakers and central bankers to a bunch of eight-year-olds playing football. And she says, when you have right. eight-year-olds playing football, they just all run to the ball to the, and yeah. th they can't think about doing anything a little bit more sophisticated. <laughs> and it's actually a very profound criticism of central banking. It's just a very high time preference institution that's about, you know, how do we stop the collapse from happening on my watch over the next six months right. Right. so I can pass the disaster off to the next guy and yes. uh, retire <laughs> yeah. in peace yeah. Yeah. and sell books. <laughs> And so you always have the incentive to be that. It's amazing, like at their most profound moments when they really get this clarity, those policymakers arrive at the same kind of conclusions that the Austrian-minded people will arrive at, which is, look, this isn't going to end well. A series of high-time preference decisions, mm -hmm. you know, is, is, is not going to work out in the long run. E even though it might work out in football for Sam Allardyce and Jose Mourinho, football's different, yeah. you know. The, for central banks and currency, the, the, the long term will catch up to you. Absolutely. It's only 90, you have to do it 90 minutes at a time in a right. football game. Right. But right. In, in real life, there's no final whistle. No, just, no, 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 it just, <laughs> just keeps going. Keeps going. That's what they're exactly. doing, they're papering over the cracks. And they've been, been doing it for, for a while now. So it'll be interesting to see what, what happens over the next, I mean, three to four years. But yes, it's exciting. And to be honest, the only thing that brings me, the only thing that brings me peace is, uh, is studying Bitcoin, you know, in a world of like chaos, it's, it really is the only thing that, that can just settle me down. Because once I went down the, 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 the rabbit hole was back in 2017. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, I actually got introduced to it properly by one of my old teammates, Hal robson Carnu, who oh, when wow. I first signed, yeah, yeah. I'd have to introduce you because, I mean, he is a blockchain expert. Like, I didn't, I didn't realize, yeah. Um, so he, when I first signed there, people would always make fun of him because he would come in and he would be the first one into training and he'd be in really early and he'd be just on his laptop just going at it, just, you know, trading away, doing all of this fancy stuff on his laptop and all of the other players used to, used to make fun of him. So he was kind of like, he was kind of like a, the laughing stock a little bit of the dressing room when I first signed. And I didn't really know, I knew players because I played against them, but I didn't know anyone really personally. I was just curious. I'm just a curious guy. So I just parked up next to him and he schooled me for, for a year. We would go on the bus. I would sit next to him for away games. Most days in training, I would get, you know, whatever I could out of him. And then that was it, slowly but surely. And I lived in Birmingham at the time. So, I, you know, I, I didn't really do much, especially my first season. I didn't really go back down to London a lot. So, you know, it was just, I spent a year or two really just doing as much as I could, you know, re researching online. And just became more and more passionate about it. I think like something like this is, is very rare for something to, um, for me anyway, to keep me gripped every single day. Like it really fascinates me every single day. Um, the invention, the, the history. Uh, and then when I started digging into your book, I mean, that was it. I was just, there was just no going back. Wow. So I, I did not know that you'd been in this uh, for this long. I thought your connection was that since you moved to Inter-Miami 
um, mm-hmm. XBTO are the sponsors of Inter Miami, and I thought that's what got you interested in uh, Bitcoin. But no, you've been in this field for a long time, huh? Yeah, I mean, I just never really spoke about it. But I think moving here kind of just changed my way of of thinking. And, you know, I think the reason why I announced like 50% of my salary in it is because I wanted to, you know, I, I would watch you guys all the time and followed you guys for a couple of years. Natalie, Brunel, Michael Saylor, all of the, all of the guys that I followed. And to be honest, I feel like it's probably one of the noblest things that you can do right now is, is, you know, try and get people to understand this. And so that's why, like, I look at you guys as uh, economic saviors, because if you think about it, like economically, the world is sick right now and we need people like you. You're almost like our economic nurses and, and doctors trying to, help help the world basically so i've always just been big admirers of you guys you know i have a platform i have a I have a platform with people that follow follow me and it was a way that i could at least try and wait raise awareness for people to to look at it and it was the only way that i thought i could uh, by announcing it anyway was the only way that i thought would at least you know, even if it changed a few people's minds on looking more into it, it was something positive that I felt I could do. So that's kind of where that came from. Um, but yeah, no, since 20, yeah, since 2017 was when I really started to, to, to get involved in it. That's amazing. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very, very, uh, flattered and it's very kind of you to say that. I'm very glad to hear that. I, uh, I, it's uh, it's mind blowing to me to one day I just uh, came across some Bitcoin stuff and I saw your handle and I looked and then it you followed me and I found that you were already following me which was a big surprise for me because yeah I uh, you know I I'm pretty crazy about uh, football yeah <laughs> I've yeah. spent a lot of my life watching and playing football I still play today I'm 41 and I still um, play about once a week. Uh, well, next time you're in Miami, we'll have to have a kick around. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will take you up on that. <laughs> anytime. Anytime. I've been uh, getting into shape and uh, practicing my kicks again. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll definitely want to take you up on that. Perfect. I want to talk more about Bitcoin, but I want to go back to football a bit. What do you think, how did Arsene Wenger do it with kids like you to turn you from 14-year-olds who wanted to just... Uh, put the ball in the back of the net to mm. patient Arsene Wenger players? Well, I think, to be honest, I mean, during that era where he, he dominated the Premier League is, is just so iconic that everyone wanted to be like, like them, you know? I think if you look at even the best players in the world right now, or even over the last 10 years, a lot of them are Arsenal fans or, or a, lot, a lot of them were Arsenal fans, you know. Um, you see pictures of legends of the game now when they were kids in their bedroom and they had posters up of, and most most of the time it's of the Arsenal legends of the, like the early 2000s. And, and so I just think that because his style of football was so revolutionary, Every kid wanted to, especially growing up in London, wanted to play that that way. So it didn't take much. He, he, he obviously didn't have to convince anyone that this was a successful way of playing football. It was pretty clear. So, you know, I mean, I signed there at 14. I signed from Wimbledon when they Wimbledon went into administration and they moved to Milton Keynes. So it was just too far for my fam for my mom and family to drop me to training. And at that age, it was just I lived I grew up in South London. At that point, we'd played against Arsenal a few times. And they asked that it was almost like a clear out of the whole academy. And so everyone was going to different teams now. And it was Liam Brady that was calling my, calling my parents and convincing them to let me come down and train. 
And, you know, my mum didn't really want me to do it at first because she just thought that she wanted me to focus on school and all of that stuff. But it was just, you know, it was just an opportunity that couldn't, couldn't really turn down in the end. And then I was there from 14 to 16. And that's when you try and uh, push to get a scholarship. So, I mean, I barely got a scholarship in the end because when I signed there, I was really shy. You know, all of the kids had all of the latest gear and we come from like a real working class club, Wimbledon, you know. So we turned up there. I went with, I came with my brother and it was just eye opening. The facilities at that age that, you know, those the, the, that we got was just incredible. Um, and so it was overwhelming at that age, you know, to go there and just see all of the young kids that were just so good but I managed to get a scholarship and then that summer you know I knew I had a lot of work to do I was 16 um so I went away before the pre-season before before uh, going full-time I just got my head down and just and just worked really hard and then I had a really good pre-season that, that season and then I managed to you know get opportunities to train with the first team when there were injuries yeah, I made my debut at 17, um, signed my first professional contract, and then, and then that was it. Yeah, incredible. I mean, it's, uh, it's the dream. It really is. Like, uh, whatever I do in my life, it'll always be plan B next to having made it as a professional footballer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a fascinating industry. I'm not sure if you've watched the All or Nothing documentary on uh, Amazon. But I highly, I highly recommend it. Um, it will give you a really good insight into the daily life. I mean, it's, it was, I, I watched it recently and it's, it was, it's nostalgic because you know what the young players go through and you, you, you know, you don't really know much about, about the world, but you're just in this, this little bubble and it's, there's just a lot of moving parts. So it, it kind of, it kind of, I feel like it's brought the fans closer to the players and the club. But you should definitely watch it. You should definitely watch it. I think if you if you if you watch it, you'll you'll be inspired for sure. You'll be inspired yeah. for sure. So you you definitely would recommend for uh, your children to pursue being professional footballers. You have no regrets about the career at all or pursuing it, right? I mean, yeah, I, I think like my kids, I would let them do whatever they wanted. I would definitely make them aware of like everything that comes with it because not really much can prepare you for it. Well, having a dad who's done it is decent preparation, I think. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it's a, it is a dream. It's a, it's a once in a, it's a once in a lifetime. If you look at the, if you look at the statistics of even being able to play in the premier league, you know, the chances, yeah. of, the chances of, of, making a Premier League appearance is is slim to say the least so you know it's always important to to have to have other things yeah but one one thing I like about football uh, is that even the players who don't really make it you know the your friends from the academy at Wimbledon and Arsenal who didn't end up making it as pros you know it, it doesn't really ruin their life you know they might make it in some lower club make a little bit of decent income while they learn a trade it isn't like in the US because it's a it's a small limited franchise model players who don't make it out of college to the big leagues. Mm -hmm. They just basically it, it ends up being really really expensive mistake in their life. Right. There's no recovering from it. No. Well the the system's just totally different. You don't have relegation here. Exactly. So there's no pyramid. So if you if you if you're not playing in the NBA, the NFL, the MLB, then you know there's not there's there's no, there's no filter there's no, there's no filter there's no there's no way that you can progress through yeah to, uh, you know get up get up get a promotion and so it's just totally different here it's totally different yeah and it's 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 why i think the us and canada struggle with developing talent you know you think that th there's about as many people in the us and canada as there are in europe and yet so many more players get developed in europe because you have so many more clubs developing players because if you develop players that play well you can get into the top leagues you know any small club mm -hmm. that develops a good academy 
can go very far. And in fact, the most successful clubs are the ones with the best academies. Like that's that's how you become Real Madrid and Manchester City and Liverpool and Arsenal. You have the best academies. And even if you even if their players don't make it into Real Madrid or Arsenal or Manchester United, they sell, they sell. a lot of these players. Yeah. And it's a, it's a significant source of income for these clubs that they sell Absolutely. to lower league players. Yeah. But even even the other way around, safe, right? Because if, yeah. you, if you think about it, like there's academies there's academies in in the UK that are renowned for producing uh and and not not the big clubs not the not the united the cities the chelseas you know you look at southampton you know they're yeah. renowned gareth bales theo walcotts alex chamberlains crew is another one yeah leicester city they they have a really strong academy and for them it's even bigger because these guys, these clubs are making their money from breeding these players and then selling them on to, to bigger clubs. Yeah. So the, the, the business model is just, it's totally different to, to the US in that, in that respect. And it works better for the athletes, even the ones who don't make it, I think, in, in, in the European model or really the global model. It's, it's the whole world follows it except the US, basically. Yeah. Do you see this changing any, anywhere in the US? You play in the MLS now. What do you think? I just think it would. It, it, I mean, you look at what they're doing in in Europe. They're actually trying to. They're actually trying to follow the US. So that's probably more what you've got to worry about. Because remember what happened with the the Super League. Yeah, you know they're trying to create more of a a, a siloed entity to to yes. keep because they're looking at it from purely a purely business model, right? how many people uh, how many people really watch Fulham against Southampton you know whereas if you can put all of the top teams into one league you're going to have the best players in the world competing against each other on a much more regular basis yeah, but it'll be unwatchable. Like, nobody wants to watch Real Madrid and Barcelona go at it eight times a year. I mean, they did it for one season where they played in the Cup and then in the Champions League, and they played five times in a few months, and it was just... Yeah, it, didn't have the same. Much. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. I agree. I agree, I th- but it's, yeah. the, it's the big guys that, it's the, it's the big guys that are uh, trying, to, trying to push for, you know, maximum revenue at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, the, the U.S. model works better for the club owners because, you know, it's a few franchise owners that make all the money. And it's, it's essentially like a Ponzi because there's a limited number of spots and they keep trying to sell the spots for a higher price. You can't win your spot in the league on the pitch. And so all the money goes into the owners of this monopoly rather than going into developing talent, mm-hmm. which, is, which is why the U.S. is so bad at football because they don't develop talent. Mm. I think that I think they are I think they are improving. I do think I do think soccer's getting bigger over here for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, in terms of in terms of obviously compared to Europe, it's it's it is different. It is different. Yeah, absolutely. Um but how do you enjoy living in Miami so far? Oh, I love it. I love it. I mean, it's just it it, it suited me nicely for, you know, the, where I was at kind of in my life. I always wanted to play in another country um, at some point. Um, and, you know, there's just a lot of, there's just a lot of things going on in this city in particular at the moment um, from more of a, like a, when you zoom out on the world and see what's going on, there's just, um it definitely suited me with with me being into Bitcoin, for example. They're very pro Bitcoin here. Um, I had a good conversation with the mayor about it, um, and what they're trying to do in this city is um, it's, it's really fascinating. It's really fascinating. So it's just an exciting place to be um, on that front. Um, and you know, the club the club is. We're we're actually pretty strong at the moment. We're having a a good season, I would say. Um, yeah, you're in fifth, I think, at this point. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're pushing for the playoffs, which is nice for the club. 
So yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I'm really enjoying it. That's fantastic. So big question, full-time Bitcoin or f- football management after your uh, retirement? What do you see yourself doing? Um, I, I would like, I think football management for me, I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure yet. I, I spoke to, um, I spoke to Jack Wilshire yesterday for the first time since he signed the, uh, for the under 18s at Arsenal. Um, so I had a good I had a good chat with him and he's obviously one of my closest friends still in, in, in the game. So, you know, I can get a good insight into what it's really like. I definitely feel like I, I should, I should probably stay in the game um, to some level because there's a lot I feel that I can give back to the sport and to, to young kids um, in helping them develop in many different ways. But yeah, I, I do, I do strongly I feel strongly enough about about Bitcoin to say that I could, I would be excited to to explore some avenues after after I finish in that in uh, in that regard. So I think a bit of a mixture would be ideal for me. A mixture would be ideal. That's uh, yeah. It's it, it's an incredible thing about Bitcoin that people from all walks of life they take the orange pill and. It just becomes the most interesting thing going on. Um, yeah. Basically, I think, you know, uh, this becomes clear when you look at somebody like Michael Saylor, who's basically spent the last two years, spent a significant amount of time over the last two years on Bitcoin Twitter. And, you know, people from all over the world can get the same experience uh, that Michael Saylor spends a lot of his time doing without having any of the resources of Michael Saylor, because it's just him at a screen looking Incredible. at Bitcoin tr- Twitter and it costs practically nothing to do it. <laughs> Incredible, <but> yeah. <laughs> it's the most amazing show in the world. <laughs> I wake up every day and I'm just like praying for a video from him. Like there, there, there is not a video that I haven't seen. There is not a video that I have not seen. I got lucky uh, enough to meet him. I went to his house and met him I, uh... a couple of times and um, just the most fascinating guy, just the most fascinating guy. And it, it's so funny that you can just tell that if you're not if you're not talking about it or it's not on topic of conversation at the moment for him he's just he's just not that interested he's just not that interested so but fascinating guy fascinating guy uh, i have to uh, i have to chase him up again soon and just pick his brain yeah maybe we could all hang out next time in miami we'll definitely. a lot of fun yeah definitely so what do you what do you think uh, in terms of sportsmen and Bitcoin? Let's get back to Bitcoin now. What do you see in terms of the uh, do, do you see a lot of sportsmen becoming open to the idea? Do they see the synergy? Because in my mind, I think I, I think, you know, the stories about uh, athletes who retire and go broke very quickly are just so enormous. And it's because because of the inflation, you know, you can't be an athlete and focus on winning trophies and also manage a portfolio. Like you can't do it if you're a dentist or a doctor or an engineer or an athlete. If you have a job that requires focus and dedication, it's not gonna allow you to follow what's going on with the the IMF and the Bank of Japan and uh, the commodity market. I think basically all high-performing people in any field have to zone that stuff out and focus. And for athletes, that means trusting others with managing their money. Um, without the expertise of knowing how to assess and manage and hire people to do this, a lot of them end up with very bad stories. So I would say that there'd be a natural uh, appeal among athletes with Bitcoin. I know Stefan de Vrij, the Dutch central defender and Inter Milan central defender, he's also a big time Bitcoiner. But uh, what about uh, the rest of them? What do you think? So from my experience, when I announced it, I did have quite a few people reaching out to me to ask about it and a few players at the club as well. It's just so fascinating that I think for me, it's like you say, once you've, once you've kind of gone, once you've kind of gone down the rabbit hole, you've, I find it fascinating. Some of the questions that are asked, for example, you know, I announced, I announced 50% in, I think it was December. And obviously, I don't know, the thing was at like 60 K then, and there's been a 70% drawdown and people think that I've lost all of, all of my money. Right. So, but they don't, they don't know that I, I, I do this every month where it's, I still get paid by the club, 
I just have a I just have a deal with XBTO separately that 50% gets when it hits my account goes to them and then they convert it and send. So it's kind of like a dollar cost average. And yeah. but obviously for people that don't know about this, they think that I've just lost 60% of my salary. And so you have to kind of start, you have to kind of really start from from the beginning because people just don't know. Uh, people just don't know about it. So I feel like once once I break those first few, you know, questions, it that the the penny starts to drop a little bit more. And so I think that that's just what's going to happen uh, slowly with people once they get their head around, you know, how you can get paid in in Bitcoin and why this will benefit you in the long term. I think more and more people will you know, we're warm to it. Um, but it's just still, if you, do, if you haven't done the work, if you haven't done the work on it, you're just not gonna, you're just not gonna know. And the people that are managing all of the athletes and not just athletes, but like you say, most people that don't manage their own money, that it's, it's the people behind them that you need to really get into, you know, because, the, the first thing these athletes are going to do is look at is look for advice from their financial advisor, right? And it, in, in these financial advisors, uh, who are they working for? What what company are they working for? Do, do they are they pro Bitcoin? Do they not? Do they not like to touch it? Do they do they find yeah. it risky so that they're you know they're not going to want to risk losing their clients' money and. So I think it's more the people behind these these yeah. uh, these athletes that is is more is more important because at the end of the day I might know you know I might know enough about it for myself but for me to tell go and tell someone about it they have to they have to trust me and I'm just a, I'm just a footballer you know I I don't have any credibility I'm not a computer scientist I'm not a blockchain expert I've just done enough work that's given myself enough conviction to, to go and do this. I think at the end of the day, you have to do a certain amount of work. And I just, I just consider myself lucky that I was curious enough to look at this because they, that's what they say about the, the early Bitcoiners had, had three things that, or one of three things that no one else had. And it's intelligence, curiosity, and conviction so if you didn't have one of them you probably didn't you probably didn't do the work on bitcoin right and so i feel like for me it was it wasn't so much intelligence it was it was curiosity for me it was curiosity and conviction for me that that really um that i feel lucky that i have that i i had that to in order to get involved in this but if you if you don't if you don't have uh, one of those three things, then, you know, you're probably going to be behind. I mean, I, I disagree with you. I think uh, you don't manage to get to where you got in the game and also manage to get Bitcoin on the side without a significant amount of intelligence on top of uh, your <laughs> curiosity and conviction. It's really impressive that you've gotten into this because I can imagine, as you said, ultimately you have to surround yourself with people that manage your money. And these people, um, it's a job for them. And the problem with Bitcoin is that in a sense, it... Um, puts them out of the job. It's saying to athletes that you don't have to be hiring somebody to follow what's going on in the global interest rates and wars and geopolitics and commodity markets and supply chains right. in order to know where to invest and uh, beat inflation for the next uh, 10, 15 years of your career. You just need to stack sats. And uh, over time, you know, by the time you retire 10 years from now, there's going to be only a, a much smaller uh, a, increase in Bitcoin than uh, in yes. pretty much everything else. It's just betting on that uh, rather than managing the money day to day. Yeah. So it's I, I can see kind of the, the conflict of interest that prevents it because they're likely to take, go to their trusted money person and say, hey, what do you think about this? And that person is going to see, you know, even, even with the best of intentions, they just don't 
likely <laughs> like a scenario that involves putting them out of a job. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's that's what you that's what you're facing. That's that's literally what you're facing. And most of these guys, they they don't manage their own money, like you say. So, you know, it's gonna it's gonna take I think I feel like it's gonna take time, but I think you will definitely start to see it with high net worth individuals at first because you know the way that they the way they see it is they ha- they have a significant you know significantly more money than the average the average person i feel i feel like it goes back to when we were saying about the the high time preference football is if you get a chance to to shoot even if you're 30 yards out you've got to take it because you don't know when your next opportunity is going to come and it's like you know the average individual they have enough they have enough trouble trying to pay rent every month and bills and so if they don't understand this thing how are they you know how are they expected to you know say put a portion of their salary aside or their savings aside to put it into something that they don't understand it's just going to be unlikely that yeah people are willing to do that um and so, which is, which kind of, it saddens me a little bit because, you know, I feel like this, the, the whole idea of Bitcoin is, is for these, is for these people, you know, for the people that don't have access to a bank, people that, you know, just feel like they're always two steps behind in, in, in their life and they just can't get ahead. And they just feel like they're just in this wheel that is just going round and round and there's just no way out. Um, that's that's you know i feel like primarily it's more more for them um and what what i would what i don't want and which was why i kind of announced the salary thing just even if it helped a few people try and research it is you know you don't want the time is kind of now really rather than in 10 years when you know the thing is a lot further on down the line and the network's 500 times stronger, you know? It's not to say that they've missed the boat because I, I, in my view, I don't think you're going to miss the boat for a while on this because the potential of it is so big. But, you know, the earlier, the better, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. What, what have you found has been effective in communicating um, Bitcoin's value proposition with uh, your fellow athletes? Yeah. If, uh, you know, for, for the average Bitcoin standard podcast listener who's trying to orange build their local uh, athlete, what do, you, what do you think is the kind of good selling point that it has worked? The one that always uh, works well for me is, is talking about, is introducing them about market cap. Because... Mm-hmm. It gives you a clear, it gives you a clear view or scope as to where it can actually go. And so I normally try and start with all this is is is, e- is being able to email gold. And so I compare it to gold first. Mm-hmm. And then I say, okay, well, if the if the market cap of gold is 10 trillion, and currently this thing, I don't know, is five, six hundred billion. You know, we live in a, we just live in a digital world now. So it just makes sense, you know, like I just try to tell them about revolutionary technologies and how they have advanced. And, and then I say, you know, you would like to think that this thing next will just eat gold and it will just, it will just swallow gold. And so there's a, you know, there's a 10 X, there's a 10 X from there. And I feel like that raises that raises eyebrows um, the most for me um, when I speak to people about it. Yeah, I guess it's it, it's a good place to start because ultimately it's it's uh, it makes a lot of sense. And you put it this way because yeah, there's this many coins out there, and we know that for sure. And you know, you can say with confidence you have a node that says exactly how many coins there are right now. And you can buy and sell one of these at any of these exchanges for this much. I think that that's a very good way of anchoring people into the reality of this. Like it's a thing that exists on people's computers, but you can buy it and sell it um, on exchanges. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's, uh, as we speak, there's about 400 billion, sorry, 400 trillion dollars 
No, wait, four hundred billion dollars. Ah, this inflation means uh, we're losing track of zeros. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think any generation has had to do numbers at so many uh, digits. Like we currently, uh, except for fiat, you know, twentieth century. But we currently, you know, in our day to day, we pay for things in uh, things in the range of a dollar, half a dollar, two dollars. And then when you think about what government is doing, you're thinking in the range of trillions of dollars. Mm-hmm. That's 12 zeros. <laughs> this is a lot. I don't think people had to do this much math before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, just, we're just inventing more and more uh, bigger numbers at this point. Yeah, I think so- soon, um, uh, 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 <laughs> spoiler alert, what comes after trillion is quadrillion. Quadrillion, so. <laughs> It's going to soon come in. There's soon going to be mentions of a quadrillion uh, dollars in supply. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Bitcoin is still only $400 billion, uh, which is, you know, not uh, huge, but also not nothing. Uh, right. It's a huge market. It's bigger than most companies, say. Yeah. Yeah. That's another one as well. That's another one that, that I, I use uh, is that it was the fastest fastest uh, thing to reach a trillion in in market cap in less than 10 years faster than google amazon facebook all of those so that raises eyebrows as well nice so what do you think in terms of uh, do you have ideas about what you want to do in the bitcoin space moving forward do you are you you're still focusing on your football career for now yeah i'm still focusing on it but it definitely um it's, it's because it's a passion of mine. It's just what I do in my spare time. So when I'm bored picking up your book, I haven't started the Fiat Standard yet, by the way, um, but I will be I will be starting that soon. A, a, a big thing that I would love to do is is try to read because I'm I'm from Barbados. My dad's from Barbados, mm-hmm. so that he he lives there, and a lot of my dad's family live there. So and obviously I live in Miami now, so I'm close I'm close to there. Um, but I, what a dream of mine would be to, to get in touch with, with the prime minister there and convince them to, to make Bitcoin legal tender in the country. Um, but you know, I've not, I've not managed to, um, I'm working on, I'm working on at least trying to get an introduction. Um, I've met, I've met the, I've met the, 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 the minister of finance, um, once, um, but it's just, you know, it's not a it's not an easy task but that would be a dream of mine to do that yeah because you know the country is it's a tiny island they 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 left the republic in in december i don't know if you saw that they left sorry they 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 left the monarchy they left the monarchy sorry yeah so now they are um they're a republic so uh there's just obviously going to be a lot of changes in the country so i mean it's it's kind of like a it's kind of like my it's part of my heritage you know so that would be that would be one of the things that i'd love to do yeah so maybe you can help me we can fly there together oh absolutely i'd love to uh, i i can uh, I, I can handle going to barbados i don't think that's a bad place. <laughs> yeah beautiful <laughs> island yeah i'm sure i'm sure it would be great and it's very close to miami where you are yeah yeah hmm. it is yeah I went in June for a few days and we had a break to just uh, go over there. And it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful Island. Um, but yeah, I mean, things like that. Uh, I would like to create an academy here. Um, I think I'll, I think I'm, I'm, well, I'm working on it currently at the moment. Um, So I'm thinking, you know, there could be an idea to do a, a Bitcoin Academy, you know, not only, football football lessons to to the kids but also also bitcoin lessons and I, i'm lucky enough to since i moved here and announced the salary thing that i have uh you know created a little a nice community here of of good bitcoin guys and i'm sure i could raise raise a bit of raise a bit of money keep keep the whole balance sheet in in bitcoin anyway for the academy you know, charge a small amount. I wouldn't want to make a lot of money off of it. It's just a way that I can give back to, to young kids out here because so many kids want to play out here, you know. So I'm, I'm currently thinking of ways to structure it where I could, you know, give them an incentive to not only study the game of football, but also to study Bitcoin. So I could maybe offer 
offer a discount if they're willing to do to do just even if it's an hour an hour a week um and just bring in experts to just talk to talk to the teenagers about it um so yeah that's that's an idea of mine that i've had um nice so yeah i'll be following i'll be following uh i'll be following up on you about that as well absolutely Maybe if i did it one day you could come down and speak to the speak to the young the, the next generation you know Yes, and uh, maybe I'll invest in some of their uh, contracts. Uh, maybe we we'll get the next uh, <laughs> perfect superstar. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> as long as they take their salary in uh, in Bitcoin, I'll be happy. Yeah, as long as they stack in Bitcoin. The more important that's is true. the stack in Bitcoin as well. Yeah, yeah. that's the, that, that's that's, the uh, that's that's the scoreboard that we play against. You know, that's the that, these are the goals. Yeah. How many do we stack? How many yeah. people do we have stacking? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you okay. could do that. You could do that, right? You could, you could, you know, you could charge people a small amount for these, these academies and you just hold it. You just hold it in Bitcoin anyway, right? You, you could just hold it in Bitcoin for five, five years and then reinvest the money into the academy to make it bigger. Um, yeah. It's definitely an idea. I'll pick your brain about it over the next uh, over the next couple of months. Absolutely, happy to chat anytime. Great. Uh, all right, we have another question for you from Peter. Peter. Yeah, thanks, Kieran. I wanted to ask a question about one of the points you made earlier in the podcast about the economic model being different. And you said that in the US, uh, they have a model where they're more pursuant of profit, and then in Europe, they have a, a different kind of model with the leaks where it's it's maybe focused on something else i just wonder if you could explain that a bit further because i'm not too familiar with how that how the funding works and why is it that if there is a different way of running the leaks that is more profitable why is it that that hasn't been implemented is there is there a, a specific reason for that well i think back in europe it's because football isn't about uh, isn't about profit right it's a working it's a working class sport and people want to see, you know, people want to be able to see uh, Leicester win in the league, right? Which is just it, which is just one of the most iconic, unique events in sporting history. But you can't have that here. You can't have a team that's you know climbed up however many leagues and go and do something like that because. Once you're in the NFL, you're you're in the NFL. You don't you don't come out. You know, it's just it's just a franchise. But I think it just you know America is fundamentally built on capitalism, right? So it's just that's just how they are as as a nation. Whereas back home, it's it's a little bit more it's a little bit more socialist than than here. And I think that that's why. You know, there was so much uproar when they were trying to do the Super League because the people people back home that go and spend, you know, all of their savings on going to watch their club, you know, they want to see that one day a team that's in League One could get promoted to the Premier League. And these are these special moments are what football is about. So I, I think that that's why there's just so much there was so much backlash on the on the super league stuff and then over here for them to to for them to change that i think it would it would kind of go against what their country is about it would be like they were going backwards if that makes sense i'm i'm going to have to slightly disagree here with you with all due respect you know we are a very capitalist friendly space here so i'm going to make the case for capitalism why I think it's kind of the other way around. In fact, I think the European system is more of a capitalist system because you have free competition between clubs and that anybody can own a club. You and I can go and set up a club anywhere in the world except the US and Canada right now and literally become world champions. You know, we can uh, work our way up from the Vietnamese 
third division, uh, where we start or sixth division, work our way up to become Vietnamese champion, Asian champion, and then world champions. Mm -hmm. Or we could do it in England, we could do it in Africa. The only place where you cannot do that is America and Canada. You start a club here, you play in your local league, and that's it. You can't, you win your local league 10 years in a row. There's no other league for you to play in. You yeah. don't get bigger. Um, you, you, need, you need to get $100 million and go buy your spot in the MLS. Yes. Which, which is essentially like a, a, a system that's protected. It protects club owners at the expense. Right. It, 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 expen it protects 30 club owners at the expense of thousands of smaller club owners and thousands of young players and thousands of fans in these small towns. You know, you don't have the equivalent of small town clubs in England. You know, Brentford, they beat Manchester United last week 4-0. Yeah. And 12 years ago, Manchester United were close to being U European champions. They lost the final to Barcelona in the season in which Brentford were finishing, I think, eighth in uh, League Two, which is the fourth division. Yeah. So there's about 100 places between them. The one, one was playing Barcelona in the Champions League final. And the other one was playing in a, in a league nobody watches. Well, not nobody, but you know, people in that town watch it. People in yeah. Brentford go to watch their club. They get 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 fans, but they work their way up, but now they beat Manchester United. Yeah. I think that's more of a capitalist system in that you have free competition between all of these clubs. Yeah. And I, I think this is, this is why fans protested in Europe because they didn't want, you know, Liverpool fans didn't want to have to play Arsenal and Manchester United all year oh, yeah. long yeah. and just continue to play this. No, I think it's much better when you have to play Crystal Palace and West Brom and Manchester United and Arsenal, where you have to win your place in the league every yeah. year because you could get relegated. Yes. You know, Manchester United will get relegated this season if they uh, continue to play terribly. Um, yeah. Who knows? Uh, it's, it's happened to big clubs before. It's happened to them and we can help. <laughs> I like that he's thrown that in there. The, the United could get relegated this year. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I do I do agree. I think that the American owners, they, they would just, the reason they wouldn't do it is because they're not going to take on that risk. If you get relegated from the Premier League, you know, you're, yeah. you're losing a lot of, you're losing a lot of money, right? As a, as a yeah, but I mean, a lot of people will take on the risk to get to the Premier League. So yeah, the big current owners, a lot of them will end up having to play in a lower division. Boo-hoo. But, you know, maybe don't suck on the pitch yeah. and win. That's, That's the, whole the whole point, point. of the sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's why it's just so... It's, it is alien for Europeans to, to, to not have relegation. They just don't... They don't understand. Yeah. They don't understand the, the system here. No, it makes no sense that a lot of the se regular season games just end up being meaningless because if you're not going to make playoffs, then you're not going to make playoffs. It doesn't matter. Um, so you, you don't care if you fin In fact, it's better for you to finish bottom because you get a better uh, draft pick. It's yeah. perverse. Yeah. Makes a lot of games unwatchable, but in the Premier League, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible, the difference. It took me a while to, to adjust. But like, I think after, since being here for a year, like I really, like I love NBA. I, I love the NBA. Yeah. Um, I've, I've gotten really into that. But yeah, in terms of the, of the feeling of, you know, promotion, relegation, getting into Europe, staying in the league. Yeah, you got, like, you got relegated and promoted with West Brom, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. You've done it all done it all so these 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 feelings are um you can't you, you can't really recreate that for fans for yeah. players for people involved in the clubs um you know it's high it's high stake high yeah stake. it's it's incredible to think that you know small town where you know 10 years ago you you could go and pay five pounds to watch your local team and you knew the local players and then 10 years later they're out they're uh, beating Cristiano Ronaldo 4-0. Yeah. You're, you're paying 10 times as much, but you're getting to beat Cristiano Ronaldo in Manchester United 10 yeah. Yeah. 4 0 yeah. yeah. But no, I, I agree. Like I feel like the system back home will just always be that more special um, because, like you say here, once you're at, once you're, once you're at the top, you, you're at the top for, for good until, you yeah. know... Yeah someone else comes along and buys you or, or whatever. But um, I'll, I'll have to, I have to agree um, being the, the European system. Um, I'll probably always favor more. 
Yeah, I think I think it's the reason why Europe develops much better players because you have a lot more competitive uh, football at every level. You know, under 15s is competitive in England because having valuable under 15s, you know, you could sell them uh, or they could get you into, you know, in a couple of years they could get you into the first team and they can yeah. get you promoted. So th there's high stakes all along. But here in the U.S., unfortunately, in, in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, there, there's no, there's no added value from developing young players. They can't get yeah. you into the MLS. Yeah. So very few people invest into small local clubs. And it's, it's sad because clubs are, it, it play an enormous role in keeping kids off the street. I mean, it, we've been teenage boys and we know that, you know, football really is what keeps a lot of kids out of gangs, out of trouble, out of uh, doing drugs, out of doing all kinds of insane things. Um, having to wake up and play football yeah. is great. Uh, it's great motivation, yeah. discipline. Yeah. That's what local oh, clubs yeah, for do. Sure. It teaches you it teaches you more than just the game of football uh, from a young age, for sure. Tell us more. Who, 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 who other? Which other footballers do you know are uh, orange pilled, uh, or at oh. least you know the ones that are comfortable being public about it? Perhaps some of them are not comfortable being public. Um, other players. There are uh, there's a, there are a couple back home that just from speaking to me have actually gotten involved in. Um, I won't name them because I haven't spoke, I haven't pre warned them that I was doing this. Okay, yeah, yeah. Players that are, uh, um, but I spoke to Hal, so he said that he was he was happy for me to to let him know um, that I was going to mention nice. him because I I you know I've got I have to give a lot of thanks to him because he was the one that kind of got me into it. Um, so. You know, I called him to make sure that I could I could mention him, and he's he's a great guy. Um, but in terms of other players, there's a few players that buy it, that 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 buy it. But you know, how heavily they're involved, I'm I'm not I'm not so sure. I'm not sure. I'm not so sure to be honest. Are you still in touch with Alex Oxley Chamberlain? Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. I am. I oh, am. Nice. Still, if, a, still a uh, close friend. If you if you if you want me to orange pill him, I'd be very happy to. He's a current Liverpool player, so I. Oh yeah, uh, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll I, drop him a message. I'll drop him a message. I I, I deliver him a special personal orange pill anytime. <laughs> <laughs> he um, yeah, he's just he's just had a baby, so he's uh, he's oh, playing, he's playing daddy right now. So nice. it might might be a good time to get him. It might be a good time to get him now now that he's a dad. Oh well said, my congratulations. Yeah, I will. I will. Okay, uh, Peter has another question for you. Sure. Yeah, um, thanks very much. So it was interesting to hear that you got into Bitcoin in 2017. That was the same year that I got into Bitcoin as well. And I just wanted to hear your perspective on the rate of adoption that you've seen, particularly given that you've lived in the UK and the US. Yeah. Um, do you think, have you been surprised by how like fast or slow adoption has been? I, I personally would have expected it to be a lot further forward than it is in the UK when I started out in 2017. Yeah. Um, is, does that match your experience? And what's it like in the US in comparison? Well, it's so much more advanced here for sure. But when I was studying it back in 2017, I remember reading um, and just, you know, started to follow the community on Twitter and stuff like that. And when I was learning about it and I was reading that, you know, countries were going to adopt this as legal tender and companies were going to put it on their balance sheet. And I was like, I was like, mm, I, I, I wasn't convinced because I'd only just started, I'd only just started studying it. So the fact that, you know, looking back now at that and seeing, that companies are actually doing it and countries are implementing it. It's that for me is fascinating um, in just five years. So I think for me personally, it's, it's actually gone a lot further than I, than I would have first anticipated at this point. Cause I never, I never, even when I was studying it, I never really thought that, you know, it was going to, pick up this uh this traction so quickly but moving here has made me think how 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 slow it has been back home to be honest um just because it's just everywhere here you see atms you see uh shops accepting it and so you just don't really get you just don't really see that back home so yeah i would say it's kind of like a middle ground for me 
um, just because of what I was reading before and the, the, the people that were saying that all of these things were going to happen and then it's just happening right before, right before your eyes. It's just fascinating to see. Fascinating. Amazing. Uh, Max has another question for you. Yeah. Hi. When speaking to Bitcoiners or plebs, uh, one thing that a lot of people are experiencing is like once they understand Bitcoin and go down the rabbit hole, their life changes radically. So for me personally, I've been like interested in way other topics than I was before. I, I was like educating myself in other ways and also changing my whole diet and um, working out. So, so I would be interested if Bitcoin had this um, impact on your life and if it did so in what, what kind of sense? It, it probably did, you know, when I, after like I read Saifi Dean's book, it, um, it slowed me down. It slowed me down a lot more, you know. Uh, I spent a lot of time, I have a, a lucky enough also to have a lot of friends that are involved in various different types of businesses. And, you know, I'm lucky enough that I get presented with a lot of investment opportunities. And um, I think it just, you know, I was always 100 miles an hour reading people's decks and um, trying to think about, you know, where I can put my money into different speculative startups and it it really just like made me just take a step back because I, I I do enjoy doing all of that stuff but at the same time there's just a piece there's a piece that uh, comes with with buying Bitcoin that that I have and so now I'm just you know I'm, I'm a lot more selective now if I if if I think about you know would I rather a Ferrari or for 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 200k or would would i prefer to to you know add a few more few more bitcoins to my wallet easy decision um, right it's gonna it's just an easy, it's just a no-brainer it's just a no-brainer you know i mean i luckily luckily i've never re really been into like flashy cars and stuff but i mean it, at this point it just yeah it just gives me um it makes me, makes me think more about the long term it makes me think more about the long term um, and that's what that's you know a lot of that comes down to Saifi Dean's thinking, um, and that's why I'm I'm thankful because that that book really kind of changed it, it changed my it changed my life in that regard. You don't have to run around all the time like all the time doing all of this crazy stuff trying to trying to outbeat inflation and like you know working super hard. I like to think I've I've worked I've worked pretty hard. Um, so far, and I just need to, I just need to find something to store what I've earned in a, in a safe place, and um, that's that's for me what what Bitcoin does. That's amazing. It's, it's it's incredible to hear this. Like I was writing this stuff in a book years ago, and then um, seeing it come back to me from Kieran Gibbs is just <laughs> absolutely mind blowing. I, I, not the future I expected, but I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure. When, 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 I, when you messaged me on Twitter, it was like a, it was like a, it was like a pinch me moment because you guys helped, you just help, you know, um, trying to help so many people. Um, and it's, it's uh it's admirable it's a, it's admirable what you guys um what you guys are, are doing so yeah I, I just thank you thank you thank you sir thank you thank you uh thomas do you mind uh, get it, uh, taking another question from thomas i'll follow sure. up yes uh so basically what i was trying to go with my question is that um as a gunner i've struggled all my life seeing um Ari going to Barcelona, Van Persie leaving, um, all of these great players, you know, leaving the club. So my idea is like maybe in the world of Bitcoin, uh, where let's say in the future we have Bitcoin, which is a stable money, which is non-inflationary. Maybe these teams, these clubs, which are, let's say Arsenal, they're not as rich as Man City, or they're not as rich as Real Madrid. Uh, they can have more financial stability to not sell players like and break our hearts so like players like that are we, like if you, if you look in the in the past you have like steven gerrard and pirlo all of these great players they stayed with their hometown teams not steven gerrard i guess but they stayed with their uh, local teams in the end 
So maybe with Bitcoin, these clubs will have like more stability and the players will stick around with their teams longer than because we, we grow as fans, we grow to love the players. Sure, like sure. Alien, and when, when we see them go to their to our rival teams, that breaks my heart. So maybe that, that's something Bitcoin can fix. I, I, I agree. I agree in, in, in the respect of players that leave because they want to earn more money, right? Because you've got some players that left, that obviously leave because they have an opportunity to change their life even more for their families and, and their, their hometowns and, and whatever. But you also have some players that, that leave not just for financial reasons. And so I'm not sure Bitcoin can fix that, but it can definitely fix it for, for, for the first point, you know, for, for players that, that want to leave because they, you know, they feel like they're underappreciated uh, financially. So, but also it can help the clubs that are, that are early adopters of this. If you, got, if you get a club now that's in League One or League Two, you know, and they put this and they, they you know, they, they take a punt and put this on their, their balance sheet in 10 years, then, you know, th- they could build a foundation that can really climb them up the leagues and, and, and invest into the club. Yeah, I think it can help for that reason as well. Yeah. yeah, I think now that you mentioned it, Thomas, I think another way it occurs to me now is that uh, the reason we get so many uh, problems like Manchester City and Chelsea Football Club, uh, as Arsenal and Liverpool fans, we both agree these are pestilences that shouldn't be there in football. But a big reason why these things happen is that the people who own all of that money don't have a decent store of value, don't have a place to put money into it. So if you happen to make $10 billion, you get to a point where you buy a football club because what else are you going to do? Where else are you going to put your money? You can't hold cash. You can't just keep buying more US dollar treasuries. You can't just keep buying stocks forever and you can't follow the stock market. And at some point it becomes more fun to go go and just buy Chelsea Football Club and go and watch them and, you know, uh, uh, mess around with Jose Mourinho uh, (laughs) instead. Uh, But I think in a world in which you can just hold money and expect it to appreciate and not have to worry about this, I think a lot of those people would not get into football in the first place. And football would be run by the football people. So instead of having, uh, you know, an Abramovich finance uh, Mourinho to be a force of evil uh, in football, um, you just simply have Arsene Wenger up against uh, Liverpool every season. Yeah. And no oligarch money, no... Yeah, it uh, washes out all of the... Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. But, but these guys love football as well, I believe. Yeah, I guess. But I mean, how... how I don't know. The, the Bitcoin may, raises the opportunity cost. Currently, the opportunity cost is you buy bonds and you buy all these uh, awful things. Uh, but with Bitcoin, you know, you can have more Satoshis. There's yeah. nothing better than more Satoshis. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, the other major thing we need to talk about is the World Cup. What are your thoughts on the World Cup? This coming uh, World Cup, obviously. Yeah. Be, being in Qatar? Or no. The, you mean just what about football? <laughs> Yeah, who are you to side think? Of it. I still, I still think England have a have a really good chance. I mean, but it's just hard to write off France. I mean, the the abundance of of talent in the French national team for the next for the next decade looks um, looks looks pretty strong. Yeah, I have to say. So it, it would be hard to it would be hard to write them off. So I I, I would probably say them. I would probably say them. Yeah, that's a good, good guess. Good guess, in my opinion. I think the French have just incredible amounts of talent. Like they, they could have three major superstars injured and not miss them. Um, that's just right, so right, much right. They have. Yeah. What do you think? I have a strange uh, hunch that I think maybe this, this is going to be uh, a one major twist in the tale for the Cristiano Ronaldo slash uh, Messi saga. I think one. Of those two might win it. And, I, and I'm leaning more towards Cristiano Ronaldo. I think Messi has had a season in PSG, in which he's basically phoned it in, and he's focusing on this World Cup. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo is also 
basically phoning it in for Manchester United this season. You know, he was late for preseason and uh, he doesn't really seem to care much. He was trying to get out if he can. But I think he definitely wants to get one. One last, one for, last, yeah, one last yeah. for all. Yeah. And I it think would be, it would be nice to see. I, th- I think Portugal have a much better team than Argentina. Like the, the, they, they still have a lot of depth. Uh, you know, in defense in midfield, they've got some very good players. Yeah. Not surprise. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. I like the look of Brazil just on the, on the, on, on, a, on an offensive, on the offensive side. It just looks, strong as well um it'd be fascinating to watch i'm really looking forward to that this year yeah and on the fact of qatar i have i have a hunch it's going to be from a footballing perspective it's going to be the ideal world cup because all stadia are within 30 kilometers from one another so basically all the national teams are just going to get into a hotel and stay there for four or five weeks and not have to travel, not have to worry about mm-hmm. checking into a new place, not have to worry about acclimatization. Mm-hmm. They get in, they acclimatize, and, and it's going to be perfect weather. That time of the year in mm-hmm. Qatar, it's perfect weather. It's not going to be too hot or too cold. Yeah. And they're just going to be there focusing on the football. I think that's going to really be something different because every World Cup, there's always something, maybe not every, but with most World Cups, there's something with the travel that gets in the way of the um, uh, of the experience. You know, uh, teams have to move so much and can be exhausting or they have too much travel. I think yeah. Qatar will be very interesting in that regard. Yeah, for, for sure. Because I, it, you look at 2026 and that's going to be in the U.S., and they've already, um, I think it's the US, I don't know if it's Canada, and I think Mexico as well, they're hosting. Yeah, it's all three of them. Yeah, so that's obviously, that's a lot of, that's a lot of travel. We, we traveled the other day, we traveled last week to um, San Jose and then played three days later in Montreal. So it was, you know, li- literally a cross, cross country um, trip. And it was, uh, it was tough. It makes me think about the traveling that, 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 that all the NBA guys and that have to do. Like, it's incredible. These guys are playing every two, three days. Um, yeah. it, 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 it made me really, uh, because I used to think, oh, it's a bit different because, you know, they, they, it's roll on, roll off. They can, uh, they can get substitute. They can come off and on. And so I used to think physically, it wasn't as as tough as uh, as football, but just being here for the last year and following an NBA season, and then me tr- and then traveling myself to play games away in different states, it made me just it changed my whole perspective on what these guys are doing. Like it's incredible, it's it's really incredible um, to be able to travel every few days during a season to different states and playing at, at such a high level. Um, but even the, the, the World Cup here in the US in 2026, like I'm, I'm going to be really excited for that, even though it's a few years away. Yeah, it's, it's going to be huge. I mean, imagine a trip from Mexico City to Montreal and then uh, to Vancouver. Uh, yeah. And I think some teams are going to have to do that, you know, between a quarterfinal, semifinal and a final right. for the World Cup, which is right. incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I think one more question. I think Daniel is going to want to have a question. Daniel's a uh, hammer, an ex hammer. I think he's recovered. Daniel, <laughs> yeah, Daniel says, oh, there yeah. Is. recovered, a, a recovered, <laughs> a recovered hammer. Uh, <laughs> funnily enough, uh, but Bitcoin was part of that journey. You know, um, it started making me realize uh, how much time and effort I was putting in. And money into, um, you know, so supporting these, um, uh, I, I know Safe and I are going to disagree on this one heavily because he still puts a lot of time and effort <laughs> and money into this. It changes us in, di- in different ways. I'd like to know, um, it, it, you know, has it changed your game in any way? Uh, it, the way that you uh, anticipate the game, the way you approach the game, like mentally, physically, what, what's what's happened there and I'm sorry if that's already been covered no it hasn't um I think it hasn't I don't think it's changed my game but I think it's changed just my it's probably just changed my life in general um talking about Bitcoin right I'm guessing yeah 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's just changed my my life in general. I'm I'm just a lot more patient with things. Um, it it brings me uh, it brings me a sense of um, calmness and 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 peace. To be honest, that not so. I'm I'm less I'm less irritable about things. I'm less I'm less worried um, about money and i don't like to think about you know i don't like to think about money so much I, I like to just you know do simple things in my in my life um but in terms of on the pitch no i don't think it's changed i don't think it's changed uh my, my game at all and how i how i play the game it hasn't made you a carnivore yet interesting it hasn't well, made me a carnival. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. Everyone, everyone's a vegan now, safe in the Premier League. Remember, like yeah, you're yeah, yeah. plant based, and uh, you know this is the science. Follow the science, and the. Uh, <laughs> but what? Yeah, that's interesting as well around the money because you guys, uh, you you have sharks swimming around you all the time, uh, with um, financial advice and um, you know people coming out of left field pretending to have your best interests at heart. Those, those young kids are just making it, right? 18, 19, 20, all of a sudden they're getting the big pay package. The phone's going to start ringing and um, there's bad actors there with, with really bad advice. Uh, you know, yeah. what, how do you hope, Connor Ocus uh, as well, I mean, ex West Ham, he never made the, the big time, but, uh, you know, he's a Bitcoiner, football Bitcoiner, and there's a couple in the States. Who's that, sorry? Connor Ocus. Okay. He came up through the ranks at West Ham. Do you know Alex Cronulli? He plays at Birmingham. No, I don't. And Lucky Mukasana. He plays for um, Tampa Bay Rowdies. These are Bitcoiners in wow. the US, professional footballers. Oh, so, interesting. Uh, it's definitely, I mean, we, we need more of you guys in, in, the, um, in the changing rooms uh, helping educate those, those guys that, that have, you know, the, this expendable money that they're being mm -hmm. pushed to Mal investment, bad investments. That's just paying commission to these financial yeah. advisors and, uh, and and these other guys. So yeah. I, I hope you um you can reach some of your um especially the younger guys coming through. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, I definitely like it. Got to a point where like a, a lot of them were asking me individually, just at training and phone calls, and it did kind of make me think like maybe I could do, I don't know, um, just whether it's a seminar or something that something that stops me from having to have the same conversation m many times and just get a group together i offered i offered the boys to do um to do just a talk when we go to away games because i said to them it's probably best that you know we just get because obviously when we travel we're together a lot um it would be nice to just at least go through my experience and how i got into it with them like at, at an away game at a hotel when we're just doing nothing um and it also saves me from having the the, the same conversation um to different players all the time so i might try and revisit that maybe we should do a bitcoin for athletes video you and i i'd love that i'd love that and i'm sure that i i would i'm sure that i would it would gain a lot of a lot of traction i'm sure it would no Manchester United or Chelsea players need to apply. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do them an intro to some shit coin. <laughs> uh, we could we could also like just do like um, zoom in call. Uh, you know, uh, any of us are available on this call. Anyone put their hand up to help you out if you just wanted to do a zoom in and uh, answer, yeah. just fire questions at us. Yeah, you know, yeah, hundred percent. I just saw a comment there. Also, no Tottenham, please. I love that. <laughs> All right, final question. What was the best West Ham United player you ever played against? Um, oh, this is a good, that's a good question. Payet. Yeah. Dimitri, Dimitri Payet. Yeah. He oh, was, good yeah, he, he was, he was a great player. Um, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm really good friends with Mark Noble. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Because I did the under 21 European championships with him um oh god 13 years ago which is crazy um so he's he's a he's a good friend of mine he was actually in miami last week and i met up with him 
um because he's retired now mm-hmm. um there's a west ham west ham legend there yeah um, no time preference one club he's a born bitcoiner yeah yeah i didn't actually get to speak to him about it but yeah there's another one that i could get on on, on the call nice so, so what do you think we're, we're happy to do this right i mean let's get absolutely let's get absolutely go. i was i was gonna ask you who was the best player you've ever played with and against if you was were to say best player i've played against edin hazard oh wow edin hazard i did not expect that answer but yeah he was incredible that is for well. sure for sure uh that he had one season at chelsea where it was just it was just unplayable um so i would say him best player i played with santi cazola oh wow santi cazola you played um, with thierry Henry. yeah but he I, i was young when he was i didn't okay. play yeah but when he came back he came back for like three months um so i played with him then um but not when he was obviously during the hybrid days i'm i, I was too young oh, okay so, Were yeah. you on the pitch when he scored that goal against Leeds? Yeah, I wasn't. Was yeah, no. yeah, I, I wasn't on the pitch, but I was there. Um, the another, another, bumps, like, just, yeah. the, any football fan watching that was... <laughs> yeah. That yeah, incredible moment. Incredible. But yeah, Santi for me was just an alien. He was just an alien. From day one, all of the players just couldn't believe it. The way that the guy, his balance, his left foot to his right foot was just no different. You, you could make a run, and you wouldn't even have to look. You would just, you could just focus on, you know, what was in front of you and um, the direction that you were running in, because you knew that the ball was probably just going to literally land right in front of you at the at the perfect time, um, and just yeah, his agility. And I just loved him because he just doesn't, he just didn't really, he's not your model t- like footballer, you know, he's not big. He's not, he's not that fast. Um, and to, to play at that level, you know, for someone of his size showed you just how, just how good technically he was. That he was a master. He was a master of the game. Um, so, I think most people that if I, I I don't know for sure, but if I was to ask most people that played with him during during that time when he played, most people would say the best player they played with was him. In my, in, in, that, that's a guess, but I would say, I would say most players would say him. That's amazing. He was he was he was incredibly good. But I, I I did not expect that answer. I remember when he retired, I saw a picture online of his ankle, and he had had incredible damage done to his ankle over time. It was horrific. It was the saddest. It was one of the saddest things to see um, during that time, actually, because it was it was a, it was over time. And I remember he was moaning about his Achilles for a while before. He'd actually gone it, gone and had the surgery, and he was flying back to Spain a lot to see doctors there, and he was um, he was really struggling. And then, yeah, he I think it was like infection or something, and it just it just got worse and worse and worse. And yeah, the like the pictures of his of his uh, it would it looked worse in person. It looked worse in person. Oh and they had God. to do they had to do a skin graft and um you know take a patch of, of skin from his arm and and cover it over the over the damaged infection um because it was just completely dead. So yeah, he really went through it in the end, which was which was sad for such an incredible player. And just and more than anything with him, he was just the nicest guy. He was just funny. He was so good for his mood for the changing room. You know, if we'd had a loss or if we had, um, we was having a rough patch, he was um, he was instrumental in always, you know, keeping the mood up of the camp. Um, the incredible guy. That's amazing. I was just checking his Wikipedia and I found out he hasn't even retired yet. He's no, still no. playing. Yeah. He's playing in Qatar. In Qatar, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah he's still playing there. Yeah, yeah. He went back to. I mean, he was even when he left, he went back to Villarreal. Was it? Did he go? To yeah, Villarreal. He was in Villarreal. Yeah, he 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 really came back there. Like he was he was really good. Um, he managed, he's, the fact that he managed to recover from from that was just incredible, incredible. Yeah, I had assumed he retired, and um, he's 37, and he's still playing in Qatar. And the Qatar league is uh, is a pretty decent level. It's uh, it, it, the players move from there to Europe, and it's um, it, yeah. it's it's a pretty high level. So he's playing at a very competitive high level. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 And can, can I ask um, <clears throat> how much uh, work and effort is putting behind the scenes into the players' mental health? Obviously, there's injuries. Um, you've got medical staff on board. But is there like um, has there been a shift in thinking there? Yeah, uh, and obviously, I mean, we touched on nutrition, kind of joking, but Safe and I are um, you know in agreement uh, when it comes to like uh, the nutrition side of things. It's well, read the Fiat Standard, Fiat Food, uh, and mm-hmm. anything else. Um, mm-hmm. What's going on there? How's that? Um, it's changed so much since I was first. I mean, since I made my debut whenever it was 15 years ago, it's, uh, it's crazy to see how much it's changed. Like the mental side of the game, there's psychologists, probably a couple in every team, I would say now in the, in the Prem. We, we, I didn't, there was none of that. There was none of that back in, uh, when I first started, it was kind of, we were in the era of like the macho, uh, um, you know, you're not a human, you're, <laughs> you're a, you're a robot and you need to go and play and win every game and um perform perform at a high level so it's it's changed a lot and it's great it's great to see because it's it's definitely needed it's definitely needed clearly um clearly with some of the cases that we've seen uh over the years of, with players and not just players but people in, from all backgrounds but it's definitely it's definitely increased uh, over the last last, last few years, uh, I just actually checked. And no, in fact, I did get that wrong. You did actually play in the five-one at Anfield when Liverpool won. You played for twenty-nine minutes. I'm just checking now on transfer market. You didn't start, but you ah, played. yeah, <laughs> wow. You conveniently forgot. Yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Mate, might, I might have to just look at my start record there. Then not my uh... <laughs> yeah. And to, to be fair, by the time you came on, it was already five nil or four nil or something like that. Right. So you, you can have done it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, there's um, I, I, I'd like to keep all of only the only the good memory. Is at Anfield, to be honest. <laughs> but thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Sorry for ruining that. <laughs> I'll never get over that four-four without Shavin. Yeah, sorry. no. <laughs> Crazy. All right. Well, listen, Kira. This has been incredible. I really thank you so much for your time. This has been incredibly generous and incredibly informative. I, if I came off as a um, little teenage fanboy. Uh, that's only because I am. <laughs> I've, I've still not outgrown that phase of my life. No, you have to and keep I it. Still, you have to keep it. That's what it's all about. You I, know? Uh, I, 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 I've, I've heard the Daniel make this case that you know you just gotta outgrow it, and I don't know. It just doesn't work for me. I, the the game just gets more interesting, more compelling, more engrossing as I grow older, and it just has so many more facets that you keep learning about you know the psychology of it the 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 uh, uh the, the finances of it the money the, the when it when it becomes so big it's just it it's it's always interesting i i can't get no. over it so today liverpool will play against man oh, United yeah. and you, you need to go you need to, to you need yeah, you need to get prepared <laughs> you got an hour yes i, I need to start with that <laughs> <laughs> be a, be, a, be a great game be a, be a great game yeah, especially where they're both where where they're both at, where, how they both started. Yeah, no, we gotta we gotta get our act together very quick if we need to salvage the season. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. This has been incredibly fun. Thank you so so much. No, honestly, um, thanks thanks for having me. It's been a it's been a pleasure, and I'm sure we'll speak. We've got we've got a few things to speak about. Uh, safe, you know. My academy and absolutely, we'll we'll start a, we'll start a sem- we'll start a little seminar with the players. We we'll get get a group Zoom, and nice. we'll, uh, we'll we'll get things going. We need to get these we need to get these guys uh, orange pilled. 
Absolutely. And I'm happy to do it anytime. Thank you so much again. Guys, thank you very much. Cheers, man. Thanks. Take care.